what the Church of Scientology is so afraid of. This, this is SPTV. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming on my stream tonight. <clears throat> Actually, this for me is kind of a big deal, and I will tell you why. Um, this is actually my first um, live that I am doing by myself, and um, I am doing this so that I can start to bring some of my mother's words directly to you. Um, I've done a lot of different interviews with a bunch of different creators, and my goal now is to start bringing you some original content and also with that content, uh, be able to help share my mother's words. Um, Mom and I had looked at different options on how we could present some of these stories. And um, it's hard for me to set her up with a whole thing for her to be able to come directly on this with technology. And it adds a, uh, a tremendous amount of um, stress for her. But what we can do is we can sit down and I can do an interview with her and be able to capture uh, some of her thoughts, uh, assemble them, and uh, be able to provide them so that you're able to see what she has to say directly in her words, which I think is very, very important. Up till now, aside from one interview that we did with Leah, uh, I have been uh, mostly representing her story, which I'm happy to do, but also I would like her to be able to um, share her experiences because they are so much more powerful. For those of you that uh, are new to this channel, thank you for uh, tuning in. Um, what this is going to be is I plan on providing about a 30 minute video, which is kind of my mom's introduction and us kind of going back and forth, going over her story a little bit. Um, that'll give a general overview. Um, for those who may not know, um, mom was um, gotten into Scientology shortly after uh, my father left us when I was very young, about 10 years old, and I was raised in Scientology and I left at about the age of 27. Um, I became um, listed as a suppressive person because of the way that I left. I just left and I didn't go through their process and they don't like that very much and I was disconnected from um, by her and uh, we went through a lot as part of that. Um, more recently, I helped her escape from Scientology. I thought she was there um, kind of following what she thought was the her path in life, what I didn't know is a tremendous amount of abuse that she was subjected to. And over the course of these videos, we hope to kind of bring you some specifics on what that abuse is. The locations that we're going to be talking about tonight are um, going to be very vividly in people's minds right now because a lot of the First Amendment audits that are going on are located in the areas around Hollywood, California, down on L. Ron Hubbard Way and outside of the Hollywood Test Center. Um, it's the building they refer to as the Hollywood Inn or the HI. These are where um, that HI is where um, mom and I lived for a while when I was very young and where she was working prior to us being able to get her out of there was in that L. Ron Hubbard Way location. So what she's talking about is right there in what looks like that very scenic, beautiful area outside. Inside, it's very, very different. So um, what I plan on doing on this is I'm just going to let this video kind of roll through. Uh, I'm going to put it up. It's going to be about 30 minutes. And my plan is to not really interject um, while the video is going on, but just to let everyone kind of absorb it. What I will be doing is I'll be looking at the comments and I will be uh, kind of identifying questions. So if you do have a question, I would um, appreciate if you just started uh, your comment with question and then put that in there. And then towards the end of the um, the video tonight, once mom's done talking, then I will get back on to uh, working through the questions and uh, seeing what we can do. My hope is to get about an hour on this, but we'll see how verbose I get at the end of this. Sometimes I like to start talking and I can't help myself. Um, all right. Well, um, I do have some mods that have um, been so um, gracious as to help me on this. Uh, really, these are my ground rules on what I'm trying to do. I am um, open to people's opinions. I would ask that you present uh, whatever questions you have, e even if it's something that I wouldn't like as respectfully as possible. Um, I'm here to share truth and to bring information to you. Uh, if there's somebody that's like obviously a troll or belligerent or just creating problems in the chat, you're probably going to get thrown out. But I'm not going to try to censor the information. My mods all know this. Um, if you have a beef or something like that, or, you know, a real question that you'd like to pose, even if it's a hard question, I'll do my very best 
to um, answer that at the end. All right, um, I see there's a lot of people checking in. Um, I've already uh, been chatting here for uh, a few minutes. I'm guessing everyone can hear me because the chat's not completely blowing up with not being able to uh, understand this. I am seeing some different comments in there about some of the elderly um, that are being moved uh, in and around the buildings. So um, yes, all of there's a lot of documentation that's going on. The purpose of us providing this is to start giving you some context. Um, so you're seeing real time what's happening in there, but what's going on behind the scenes, behind those doors. Um, well, I'm going to let mom explain it to you. So let me go ahead and pull up the video and uh, I hope you enjoy it. If for some reason you can't hear the video, which I've done some testing, you should be able to just blow up the chat and then I'll see if I can work through it. And hopefully I don't have too many, uh, too many technical issues tonight. So here's mom. So you were in the Sea Org for the better part of 35 years. You were in Scientology for 38 years. Mm -hmm. um, I remember you brought me with you to the Sea Org when I was about 10 years old. That's right. And then you went and you worked ultimately at the international base in senior executive strata. You worked for uh, Ronnie Miscavige as his um, secretary. Correct. You worked very closely with a lot of very senior executives and uh, you were very much uh, service, service personnel for them, secretary, you know, taking care of all of their affairs and helping manage things, correct? That's right. In 2004, you were sent to the PAC the Pacific Area Commander Los Angeles Base Rehabilitation Project Force. Yes. That's that thought reconditioning program that Scientology has for the Sea Org members that have done something wrong. At and that point, they wanted to offload me, but I wanted to make up for any damages that I did. And so I, I wanted to go to the RPF and make up any damages I had committed against Scientology and LRH. And, and mankind. Um, so you spent approximately six years That's in the right. RPF. Yeah. And then in 2011, uh, you were then hospitalized after you had shortly got off the RPF and they had you doing um, janitorial services in their, in their area, cleaning and mopping and things. Yeah, I was a dining room cleaner. And what that entailed was I had to, you know, disinfect all the tables after and clean them off if they weren't cleaned off after the crew left. Right. <clears throat> and then I had to mop the floor in between each setting. I had, well, the floor had, it before you can mop it, you had to sweep it, dust mop it, and then mop it. And it, because it, it, there was so much traffic that came, like a thousand people for each setting. Yeah. It was a mess afterwards. And then I would have to clean all the, the lines, like there were these uh, places where they put the food. Mm -hmm. I had to clean all that up too. So it's fairly physically demanding. Totally. I was 60, yeah, just going to be 65. Okay, so you're just turning 65, and um, this was very physically taxing on you, and you also had an undiagnosed heart oh. problem that you had been experiencing a lot of chest pain, shortness of breath for multiple years, and nothing was done In about the that. RPF, but... Yeah. But it was just sort of yeah, it food, food away. But then you ended up needing to get triple bypass surgery. Um, yeah. And after you went through the triple bypass surgery, you were then put onto a different job uh, working in the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles as an extension course supervisor. Right. Where you then worked for approximately 10 years before you had a major medical situation occur, a medical problem where you ended up being hospitalized in. This is February of 2021. That's right. After you were hospitalized in February of 2021, uh, <clears throat> you were then moved into a hospice facility because they expected you to pass away. Right. Um, but it was a hospice facility that wasn't controlled by Scientology, that was being paid for by the organization. But what you then had is connection to the outside world, the internet, able to reconnect with family, yes. ultimately deprogram yourself. And then um, earlier this year, we were able to help you escape. That's right. Which was quite an adventure. I know. <laughs> I can't believe we did that, but we did. Yeah, so that's kind of the overview of what we're going to talk about. After we came out, and while you and I were in contact when you were still in L.A., we learned a lot about the abuses that you had endured while you had been there. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty significant. 
I know, until I told you about everything one thing at a time. I didn't even realize that all of that happened to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or that it was of significance. I thought, well, I must have pulled it in, you know. Right. That's the thing they always say. But that's what I thought that all those things happened because it was my fault. You know. Yeah. You always you're sort of programmed that way. So this is in late December of twenty. Um, <clears throat> you would take your vital signs or by vital signs, mainly just your O2 because you have a little finger O2 monitor yeah. that you got. I made out this little chart and I was trying to keep track of, I was trying to help myself to figure out what was going on. So I was trying to keep track of, like the only thing I had to monitor was my weight and my oxygen because I didn't have a blood pressure monitor or anything or anything to take my temperature. So no one was coming and checking on you and helping. There was no, no. There was no means you could go somewhere and get your blood pressure checked while you were there. I could have, but it would have been like I can't walk all the way over to the MLO's office. Gotcha. And so, they don't come to you, right? No. But you, you had had. But I, but see, I didn't want to say I was sick, because if you're sick, then they'll, then you're pronounced PTS, and you might have to end up going to HCO about something so I didn't want to alert anybody that I would something was wrong with me but I knew something was wrong with me <clears throat> so I'm trying to help myself right so I'm taking my weight and checking my oxygen maybe my weight in the morning and my oxygen trying to get it before I go to bed each night and I would try to get it up to 90 at least so I could go lay down because I would be Huffing, I couldn't hardly, I was gasping for air. This is why you're just sitting. This right? is why we're, yeah, I'm just sitting at the table in my room. Okay. It would be down to 86. Okay. And only get it up to 90. Like if I was breathing, like inhale through my nose, exhale through my mouth. And it would be down sometimes to 79 and could only get it to 90. You know, and it was days after days like that, clear up until 22nd of January, where I stopped doing it because I was probably getting too sick or something. I don't know. Because then in February is when I went to the emergency room. Within a week or two after that, yeah. But this shows me or showed me like what my oxygen level was. <clears throat> which was really low, and, and that's what they found in the hospital, that I had real low oxygen, mm -hmm. and uh, like I couldn't breathe properly, and, uh, and also my weight was higher, because my, my legs were swollen like from my knees all the way down, I couldn't hardly even get my shoes on, mm -hmm. they, my feet were so swollen. I was taking my weight, so I knew my weight was a lot more, almost 10 pounds more, but it wasn't yeah. 10 pounds of mass that you would put on. It was just it was water, water retention. Yeah. Okay. So, a... so you, you had, you had mentioned to me that you had, you had told the medical officer about this, Adrian yeah. Pavlov. Yeah. You're like, Hey, I'm, I'm retaining water. I'm having trouble with my O2. Um, I and, told it. Yeah. And what was her response? You're right. You don't have to hold that. I can, I can. So, yeah. So what she did, Thank you. she wrote a KR on me when I told her about it, she got upset. And then later in my ambassador, I get a KR that, uh, you know, Rosemary isn't taking her medication or, um, you know, and she's now complaining that she's retaining water and stuff like that. And uh, I, I'm just reporting this because it's her fault. She's not doing what she's supposed to do. But so the, in the medical <laughs> officer, this is the person that is responsible for providing care to sick Sea Org members, and then, but also is the primary caregiver for all of the seniors that are in, uh, have a medical condition, correct? Yeah. So this is your medical power of attorney that you say, hey, I'm having a problem, I'm retaining water, and then their, their response isn't to sit down with you, figure out why you're not taking your medication. Or send me to the doctor. Or take you to the doctor. Her response is to write a knowledge report on you. Yeah. Rosemary told me that she's extremely sick and uh, is her O2 is low and her body is retaining water 
this is not okay, she's uh, responsible for this, she's not taking her medicine, and I'm going to write her up to HCO. Yeah. They gave me the Lasix, but I was afraid to take it mm -hmm. because <clears throat> L. Ron Hubbard doesn't want you to take medication. I mean, it's been, it was so ingrained in my mind that any time the doctor wanted me to take medication, you were scared too. I was scared to death to do it. I thought he was trying to kill me. But as a heart patient, <clears throat> didn't you have normal prescriptions that you were always taking and stuff? No. No? I didn't have, no, not at all. I wasn't taking anything except vitamins. Like so, I was taking vitamin, I didn't take any medication. Were you doing consistent doctor's visits or checkups or anything? With, I didn't even have a, I didn't even have a cardio doctor. So you didn't have a cardiologist. Did you have a primary care doctor? Well, they had this Scientology primary care doctor, but he didn't really. So is that just the same <clears throat> person if somebody's sick, they take like the thousands of people that work at yeah. the back base too? It's just the, exactly. So I remember, I believe it was the 11th day of February, and I'm sitting, um, by this time, they had all the old people corralled on the second floor of the blue building because, uh, like everybody over 65, there was about 200 of us squashed on the second floor because um, <coughs> of COVID. God, it went on for months. So you were literally stuck in the second floor? They would, they would, uh, you'd have to write down if you wanted anything from the canteen. Somebody would go and get it for you and bring it back to the floor and deliver it. They bring your meals to you. They would bring our, our water. Um, well, the room that I was in, there was one, two, three, four, eight ladies in one room. Okay. And then eight. So all elderly? Yeah, we're all old. Um, so that's single beds or were they, they bunk were, beds? They were bunk beds. Bunk beds for, for elderly people. Yeah. Okay, not great. There were some that had single beds mm -hmm. and didn't have a bunk over them. There were just a couple that way. The other ones all had bunks. Mine had a bunk above me. Did you have a shower in that room? There was a bathtub that had a shower in, in that you had to step over the bathtub to get in there. So it wasn't a handicapped accessible No. It, it, and okay. so some of the old ladies, they couldn't, it was too dangerous to step into the bathtub. So they had to go down the hall to go to the shower. Like a communal shower down the hall that the other 200 people that they're yeah. in there are using. Um, and there's, there was a heads? toilet. There was a toilet in our room. You did have a toilet. Yeah. Well, that's in another room. Like it was a little toilet room with a toilet mm -hmm. and then there's another room that had the bathtub it was like supposed to be like the you know the Hilton Inn compared to everybody else that's what everybody called it they were thinking we were like the Hilton Inn my room didn't have any windows no windows. we just had one door okay. <laughs> and then you could go to the back part of the other part of the the second part of the room mm -hmm. and it had a window back in there but our section was like a bunker it was just cement walls I don't know what it used to be sounds like an old mechanical room or yeah something. but it didn't have any windows or anything and then so what about like fresh air and stuff you're saying that you're having a heart condition problems with O2 and all that what was the did you guys have uh, like central air like was it fresh air coming no in? like um I bought an air conditioner and Suzanne helped me pay. <coughs> she didn't even pay half. I paid for most of it. And she just gave me some money for it. But there was an air conditioner, a small one. That like we a, put floor, in the, a portable floor. A portable floor one in the front part where I slept. And so it was me, Rosemary, Suzanne, and Nancy were in that section. Mm -hmm. And then the other section, they bought their self a portable one. So it's like two portable ones, but there was no windows to, for the, the exhaust. exhaust fan. The maintenance guys put it in a hole in the wall that, that uh, went into the elevator shaft. Gotcha. That's how. That's, okay, so this is the so this is the room that you're living in yeah. when you're then having all of these medical conditions, and yeah. you had lived in there prior to COVID as well. Yeah. So you had been in there for some years. 
I've been in there probably about at that time. I was in a little room down the hall, uh -huh. but they consolidated us and stuffed us more. They made us tighter living quarters because there was more people coming. Yeah. So they put us in there with with those other ladies, and so it made it even more. So there were 13 old ladies in that one, in the whole thing all together. Between those two rooms? Between the two described. rooms, yeah. Okay. And then how many, you were in there for several years? I was in there probably for seven years. On that morning, I was, because I, I started telling you we were all on the second floor. Yeah. So they had made a place, I couldn't go to AOL, AO anymore. <coughs> so they made a little room, which was like in an old deserted bathroom or something. It was literally about as big as this wide, about the, you know, about the, as big as from that until here. So it's about eight feet me, by four feet? Me and Greg Tweedy were in a room like that. Okay. And they would, and it, it was like a portable desk. And uh, we didn't have computers or anything. Um, you would work in that room? Yeah, they would bring, Sandy Wilhair would print off the lessons in the, in the, at AO off the computer and bring them to me and Greg Tweedy and we would grade them by hand in there. So this is Scientology during COVID. No yeah. one was able to come in. So they were having everyone do extension courses. That's right. They were all doing extension courses. So they're having the public pay for extension courses, do extension <laughs> courses. And then they have elderly CERG members are in a very small room inside of correct. this building that didn't have any fresh air and grading them. That's correct. So I go to that little room and I'm, I can't breathe anymore. It's like, I'm like, <laughs> like that. I can hardly, I, I didn't know if I was going to just pass out and die or what. Oh so the M, the medical officer from AO was over 65. So she was on the second floor too. She had her birthing there. So I went to her room and knocked on the door. She was still in her pajamas. And I told, I said, Jane, I, I'm dying. I can't breathe. I have to get to the hospital. <clears throat> I felt like I was dying. Mm -hmm. I couldn't breathe anymore. So she said, go to your room and change your clothes because I was in my uniform. We would still have to dress on that stupid second floor in our uniforms. So I went to my room. I changed my clothes and put on civilian clothes. And it was cold, so I put on it. I remember putting on a jacket. And then Jane comes in. I'm like real slow because I to move. It was like if I moved, I I didn't want to breathe too hard. My heart would go. Yeah. go to, <coughs> so Jane came, and she said, "Can you walk down to the horseshoe?" I go. There's no way. She said, "I'll go get an, a." A wheelchair so she went and got a wheelchair I I remember sitting in the wheelchair I don't remember going down the escalate elevator I remember getting in her car she had it in the horseshoe somehow now I remember in the car I remember she drove up Catalina went across um, the uh, LA Park, L.A. Day parking lot, it was almost empty. Yeah. She just drove through there. Then she goes down um, L. Ron Hubbard Way and then turns and then she's going towards the uh, Presbyterian Hospital. Hollywood Presbyterian. Yeah, she so went I, down L. Ron Hubbard it's Way. It's literally about a, a block. A blo and a it's just a block yeah, from. It's across the street. Yeah. She must have called Dr. Lee because she her connection was Dr. Lee cooperated with Scientology's baloney about vitamins and, and medication. And, and Dr. Lee is your previous cardiologist, yeah. right? Okay. He's my previous, he's my first cardiologist that I even knew. I didn't even know who he was. Anyway, so it was COVID time and there was a big long line coming out of the emergency room, like people on foot and it was raining, so they had canopies out there so people can get in under them while you're waiting. 
to get into the emergency room. She gets, she, I, she didn't even get out of the car. I just get out of the car and she said, just go get in line and I'll call Dr. Lee. I'm under a canopy okay. and I'm sitting in a chair. I didn't even know who Dr. Lee was and I opened my eyes and I, I see this oriental guy, doctor, he's dressed in his scrubs and stuff. And uh, he said, are you Rosemary? And I said, yes. He said, I'll get somebody to come in just a moment to get you. Um, so, so then I remember going in, uh -huh. them taking my blood pressure, and I don't remember anything after that. So then you remember it I literally that don't re I must have just passed out. I d the only thing I remember then was when I remember hearing your voice when I was in, uh, what do you call that? The ICU. In the, yeah, in the ICU. And I think it had been about a week that you were in the ICU. They had then contacted uh, some of your brothers and sisters, my aunts and uncles, um, which I think it was your uh, sister Caroline, and let her know, hey, Rosemary is in the ICU. She's uh, expected to pass away. We're letting the family know because she might not only last life, but a day or two. So they then reached out to me and said, hey, your mom's in the hospital in, in uh, the ICU. They at least knew what hospital you were at. Hollywood Presbyterian, they didn't have a number for you or anything like that. So I did some research, figured out how to call, got hold of the ICU, found out what room you were in, asked the nurse if she could please hold the phone up to your ear. Um, and I said, Mom, it's Michael. I'm getting on a plane as soon as I can. There was a massive snowstorm, and I couldn't get out for about a day and a half. But I got um, on a flight within just about 36 hours, and I was on my way to California. And I would call every day, and the nurse would hold up the phone to your ear. And I remember you responding, saying, Mike, Mike. And I said, Mom, I'm going to come and see you. I love you. You know, I'm here. And you said my name a couple of times, and I think you said I love you, and then you weren't able to talk anymore. You sounded <clears throat> real far away. What was it like waking up and seeing me arrive and after not seeing me for so long? Oh my God. So, um, well, it, it's, it was hard for me to, um, I'm trying to remember <coughs> when you said seeing you, it was hard for me to even, when I'm coming to, yeah. to be, um, to have my, all of my um, visual and everything together. But, um, right, and so it was hard. Like I and I realized that you were kind of in and out of consciousness. consciousness. You were, you know, it was still things were probably kind of fuzzy. But yeah. So me being a former Sea Org member that's been declared a suppressive person, were you scared that I was there? Were you scared to see me? Like, what was what was the what it's, feelings? It's, it's such a I know it's so hard. It was like I was so happy to see you, yet I can't. Exp I was not. If anybody in Scientology was in the room, I couldn't express my feelings on how I felt that you were there and how much I loved you and everything. Um, it was like, so, it's like this torn feelings of, uh, I don't know how to, to express it. I was so happy to see you and I couldn't believe that you came and um, were you afraid of me at all? No. Okay. I'm not afraid of you at all. Like you were always my you know, my best friend and somebody that I could always tell anything to and I always did and probably got in trouble for it a lot of times. I wasn't afraid of you. I was so happy that you came. And I couldn't believe it, like, oh my God, I can't believe you're there. But yet, um, it was always like, how could I... Are you afraid that you would be punished if I came and you talked to me? Yeah, sort of like that. Then I'd have to be answerable again to anything that I might say. Because or, you would be sex-checked about yeah, being there? exactly. You'd be interrogated about the fact that your, your son and your next of kin came to see you while you were in the ICU expecting yeah. to pass away. Right. And that was a 
Could that was part believe? of the mixed emotion of it all. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I just felt like I was going to get punished if I um, expressed any love or anything towards you in front of them. And I remember you saying to me, it's all gone. And I'm like, what do you mean it's all gone? You're like, all of the money was taken from me. That's all you said. And I'm like, I don't understand what you mean. And you're like, okay. there is, I have nothing. It was all taken from me. And it was very confusing to me. I didn't know what you meant. And you started telling me about the fact that you had had all of this money taken from you right. systematically over the course of the last 10 years where you were left with nothing. So all your Social Security money, you had a, a small amount you get from a pension. That had just been being siphoned off uh, for, for auditing services. Yeah, as soon as they find getting. out, I know as soon as Scientology finds out that you have any money saved at all, or that you're receiving any money monthly, they start sending regents to try to <clears throat> get it out of you one way or the other. To me, I was offended by it. As a former Sea Org member, not that I have any belief in Scientology or think that, that any agreement with any of this, but I know what you're supposed to receive. You're supposed to, you're giving yourself and your life, living not great, you know, as you've explained, yeah. in service of Scientology, and really what you're supposed to be getting back is the benefits of Scientology right. as your main payment. Yeah. You're supposed to be getting the training of Scientology and also going up the bridge in, through their auditing or their counseling services. Yeah. You're supposed to get that as a, as a matter of course for being a seer member. That's right. And you're telling me that they're making you pay for it. And right. to me, I'm just, the, the feeling that I had was <clears throat> when, when somebody you love is being taken advantage of and abused, it's a very powerful emotion. You feel like, I felt protective, I felt angry, I wasn't sure what to do about it. Elderly staff members that have a little bit of social security coming in, they're just snatching that up too. It, to me, it made me physically feel like nauseous. It was disgusting to listen to it. But I, I wanted to try to help like understand what was going on. One of the MLOs came in the room, Barbell. Uh -huh. uh, her name uh, was Barbell Light. Yeah, Barbell Light. Uh, and she came to let you know that she had an R factor for, from the case supervisor, the person that's in charge of overseeing your auditing uh, and all of this for you. She came in to give you an R factor, basically a, a reality factor or a statement for you to understand from this case supervisor. And she said that, uh, I have a CS for you, which is what it's called. And she said, the CS has said you are authorized to drop your body. Well, that meant that, anyway, so that meant that like Barbell came in mm -hmm. and she had a message from the person who was taking care of my, it's called your case mm -hmm. at, the, at the organization, like any of your spiritual matters. Yeah. And they had given me permission to, to leave my body and, and die, in other words. What they like call dropping just, your body. Yeah, they call it dropping your body. Because your body's just like like owning a vehicle. Like, yeah. Hey, you can sell your so car. So that now. means like you separate, your <clears throat> the spirit goes out of your body, and your body's, they say, drop your body. So I don't know why they thought that I had needed permission to do <laughs> that. But apparently they do that with people that are going to be, that are going to pass away. And so they get sort of get a uh, like a farewell or it's okay to go. So that being I, said, which is an interesting thing because Scientology, <coughs> which is about your status right now. So you were R factored by the CS that you're able to drop your body. So they have authorized. So the Sea Org has authorized you to die. Mm -hmm. So at which point you're then usually given a 21 year leave of absence. So yeah. you were factually. They gave you an R factor saying that you're placed on leave for 21 <laughs> years. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the fact that you blew later is immaterial because you were actually given an R factor <laughs> that you're allowed to drop your body. So you're actually authorized to leave. So there's no reason to even declare you a suppressive person. I guess. <laughs> In their stupidity. Anyway. anyway uh, uh, I know that's a bit tongue in cheek, but um, 
I don't, I don't know if it would hold up in a court of law, but because I'm not sure the Scientology would want to talk about it. Yeah, I can't believe that they, that they sent that there. They really thought that I was going to go. Well, that was a lot. <clears throat> Hopefully everyone can still hear me. Thank you for everyone who watched and uh, everyone on the replay. Um, thank you very much for uh, going through this. I have quite a few uh, comments that uh, came through. Some uh, of the questions might have been answered um, through this. Again, this is kind of an overview. Um, we did some of these recordings a couple months ago before I really got um, going on creating content and uh, I, I realized some of the sound quality isn't great you can kind of hear her oxygen machine machine in the background and um anyway i've i'm trying to get some equipment set up and it's just a matter of purchasing the right stuff and getting it there and you know spending a little bit of money to hopefully be able to document this better so bear with me on that hopefully as we go forward um it'll get a little bit better but i do have some great material that we've been able to put together so far it's just a matter of me editing it the edits that i were doing wasn't really to piece together a story as much as is, is tried to just take out some dead space in between um, mom also has a, um, a lung condition uh, where she coughs quite a bit. So I tried to just kind of remove some of those just to give her a little dignity of not having to sit through um, watching this again. Because right now, uh, for anyone that is interested, mom is definitely watching. Um, she enjoys uh, reading all the comments and all that. So um, thank you very, very much. Um, I know we have quite a few of the questions um, that I've tried to kind of star so I can go back um, and go over some of it. Um, I'll try to go through them as rapidly as possible and also provide some context. Uh, again, for everyone, this uh, location that she's talking about where she was um, being held as an old person down in Los Angeles, this is that L. Ron Hubbard Way location, that big blue building that says Scientology, super big right on the front of it. The second floor of that building is the building in room 206, I believe, is where she was actually uh, sleeping and uh, staying with a bunch of elderly when they were going through COVID. Um, they quarantined all of the elderly on that floor. Um, and there were several hundred of them and that's where they were staying. So, um, I know we have quite a few comments. I'm going to start just, um, kind of go away from the uh, normal chat and I'll go to just the starred comments and, uh, pull some of these up and start kind of working through them a little bit. And, uh, I will do my best. Again, I appreciate everyone's, um, patience with me because I'm, I'm a little bit new to all this. So, uh, thank you. All right. So Esperanza question, did you and your mom have professional help um, to work through the, uh, the drama or the trauma? So we did have help uh, to get her out of there from the Aftermath Foundation. Um, she's now been out for uh, coming up on two years. So when all this happened, as we were uh, figuring out all of her situation which you kind of heard when she was in the hospital it will have some uh, more videos where it'll kind of tell more of the specifics of what was going on and what led up to getting her out of there um it was it was hard to piece together the whole thing of how to get her out is she even able to travel what is her full situation does she want to leave that was the biggest problem that i had because she had been in this high control organization where they controlled all of her thoughts and all of the information flow that she had had for 35 years so she was not elderly when she went into this organization. She was in her 40s and they had her in there the entire time. When you're controlled at that level, it's almost like you're a POW or another analogy would be like, uh, you know, an animal that's kept in a cage and isn't given any attention. Like you're not sure how to interact in a normal setting. I think that mom has done surprisingly well at how fast she's been able to learn technology to be able to speak out. I myself didn't start speaking out for almost 20 years, largely because I didn't want to make problems for her, even though I was already a suppressive person, but I also didn't want to do it. I just was trying to reinvent my life and trying to get past the trauma and the drama just, you know, by compartmentalizing it all and just, just starting my life from scratch and completely like never looking back. Um, yeah. So there's some other questions, which we'll kind of get into, uh, going over that, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, question. Uh, no question. The voices of children in Scientology need to be heard. Yes. Um, Deanna Ross, thank you very much. I 100% agree with that. You'll find that a lot of the children in Scientology, 
um, are now becoming grown. Like most of us are in our thirties or forties, but when we were children, we were trafficked into a situation which was not healthy. So now that we are out speaking out, um, we need to be able to tell these stories, uh, surge, um, Laura FM, all, all of us, we were in these situations when we were young. Aaron Smith Levin, we all have our unique individual stories. Um, Jenna Miscavige, her book is absolutely amazing. I highly recommend everyone go and uh, take a look at that. She mentions me in that book because my mother actually took care of Jenna when she was younger because she was working for Jenna's dad. So um, we all have a lot of shared history, but we there's three things that I think are very important in order to actually make a dent in Scientology. Child abuse making them accountable for abuse that has happened. Even if these children are now adults, they can still be brought, um, charges brought forward and actually do something about it. Elder abuse, which my mother is not the only one in this situation. She is an example of what is happening to dozens and dozens of other people. She has uh, given, helped me compile a list of over 30 others just from the little small area which she was in that had a similar situation to her of medical conditions and also uh, likely having their money taken in a similar manner that she was running into. And then the last thing is obviously the other financial crimes, not just against elderly, but against um, whatever Scientology is doing. It is a for-profit organization and they're all about making some money. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, uh, Nancy Alley question. Mike, you still helping to get others out of Scientology? I try to help any way I can. Um, again, people coming out is very hard. Most of the time, the vehicle for that that exists is the Aftermath Foundation. My hope is that in the future, we get as many foundations as possible that are willing to uh, help in any way possible for um, people if, as they're getting out of Scientology, specifically the C organization, which is their you know um, non-civilian um, membership. This is almost like their clergy. These people dedicate their entire existence to working for this organization. So my my hope would be that um, we can provide help uh, into the future. But as people ask me for help uh, and they reach out, they absolutely I'm absolutely trying to provide that. Uh, for those that are interested in uh, reaching out, let me see if I actually have a little banner or anything that covers this stuff. Um, you can actually email me. I'll pull up my email here. Um, email a lifetime ago 101 at gmail.com. That's kind of the one I created so that I can work this stuff on my channel. So that is how you can absolutely get a hold of me. All right, let me start struggling through the comments again. Um, all right, cool. Let me see. All right, Richard, uh, do the younger Scientologists see what happens to the older Scientologists and how they are treated or don't they care? So um, I think it's very important to understand the difference between a paying public Scientologist that would be like in this, uh, a civilian and then the part of Scientology, which is kind of their more um, regimented uh, paramilitary group that is working for the organization and living um, in these buildings like in um, Clearwater, Florida. They have these large um, complexes in different parts of the world. There's the one in Clearwater and then the one in, in Los Angeles. Um, and then they have multiple locations in Los Angeles. I would say Los Angeles is probably one of their, their biggest areas aside from Clearwater. Um, these people are working and they're putting a smile on their face and providing service to these paying public. Those paying public are likely rich people that are going in and doing it. Some people, if they go through that test center, they might come in for an introductory course and then they kind of get them, you know, pulled into this machine of the organization that slowly starts getting them more and more and more involved and starting to control more and more of their life. So for the C organization members, they are worked every single day of their lives. They are at that place working. They do not take much time off and you work so hard and your information flow is so compressed that the person to your left and right, it almost, um, you, you only, you know, are kind of trying to focus on your day to day. So there's, there's probably a, a certain lack of regard that goes on for problems that are other people's problems. Although I'm, I'm sure that they're seeing these old people that are struggling to try to keep up with the same kind of schedule. Um, one thing that I think is worth noting is a large percentage of the C organization membership is elderly and is starting to fall into the category of what my mother is. So they might have joined uh, early on in their lives or when they were in their midlife. But now as they're becoming elderly, they're going to have these problems. So when she was talking at the end about them being OK for her dropping her body or dying, that's really for them. They would have preferred that because it gets rid of a problem for them. And I think that that's kind of the way that they look at it. 
Um, but then the day to day people are just so overwhelmed with what they're trying to deal with that it's kind of hard to just even keep up with it. I see the live. There's a lot of other questions and stuff coming in. I wish I had somebody behind the scenes starring stuff for me, but I'm just going to keep going through these best I can. So uh, bear with me. I appreciate it. <clears throat> All right. Let me see. All right, Janet, question. Does Rosemary mean uh, that they want, I wanted to offload her? So offload, uh, this would, they refer to it as offloading or beaching. Uh, remember, they're sort of a, a quasi-naval uh, kind of um, organization. Hubbard fancied himself some sort of naval um, expert. He spent a little time uh, during World War II in the Navy, and he doesn't have a very distinguished service record. He did serve, but he never went to combat. And then when he got out, when he was hiding from authorities, he decided that he would run off to sea in international waters and created the Sea Organization. That's where the roots go back to basically in the 60s. The Sea Organization was then modeled around military service, kind of in a naval setting because they were out at sea. So a lot of the procedures kind of he took military doctrine and kind of bastardized it into his own policy letters um so that's why it kind of has that kind of nautical feel and a lot of the heritage just kind of um, goes back to that so when they were talking about offloading the ways that you can get out of the sea organization you can either do a thing called route out which say i want to leave and probably the fastest way to do that is for a couple to then get pregnant because they were having problems with uh, pregnancies being terminated, forced by the organization. And as that happened, um, they then have got into all sorts of legal problems. So you can route out. So you, you kind of leave and then you're still in a Scientologist and you're still in good ish standings with with them. And you can continue doing Scientology services as kind of, of a, a civilian Scientologist. Um, but re they refer to that as a public Scientologist. The other way is to uh, blow. That is their word for an unauthorized departure. So Mark Headley's book, Blown for Good, that's when he left. He just left. And I left in a similar way. In 2003, I just escaped. I was at the international base. I was going through a whole lot of bad situations, um, which I'll go get into in other videos. But I blew. So in that case, when that happens, you will most of the time be declared a suppressive person um, with some exceptions, depending on the importance of the individual and what they might mean or what leverage they might have over the organization. If you start to speak out, you will instantly be declared a suppressive person. They have no tolerance for any opposing viewpoints. The other option is to be offloaded, where they say, hey, you are such a problem for us, we're going to offload you. And it made me go to another question, why was she being sent to the RPF? And, I'll, and I see that there's some other questions that go over this. She was being sent to the RPF because four years earlier, they were kind of cleaning people out from the international headquarters. She worked for Ronnie Miscavige, and he had um, engaged in some quid pro quo sexual actions, and then she was blamed for it. So he remained on his job. Um, and then later he ended up blowing and leaving the organization. But then later after he was gone, Rosemary was like, well, what are we going to do with her? She never did really anything wrong. And they're like, well, there was that thing with Ronnie Miscavige. Let's send, you know, let's offload her, or, you know, threaten her. And she was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Can I go to the re rehabilitation project force? That's her gulag for, you know, thought reconditioning. And she really thought that she had done something wrong and she had to pay, pay for her sin. So that's, um, yeah, there's more details to a degree that we'll get into in some other videos. I really don't want to go into specifics on that because, you know, though I'm not a fan of Ronnie, uh, the point is kind of dealing with the, the problem at hand, which is Scientology and the, the abuses that are still going on. It's an important part of the story, but I don't think mom deserves to have those details kind of spread out any more than we've already kind of talked about it. But uh, I appreciate this and hopefully I have a kind of answer to uh, some of the other ones so I can kind of quickly get through uh, some of these. All right, uh, Lathanda Grotlinger. Sorry if I butchered your name. That's the best that I've done just off of watching other people's feeds. So I'll, I'll blame one of the other creators if they're saying it wrong. I'll, uh, hello, Mike. Thank you for bringing your mom's story to us. Please let her know her voice is heard all over the world. Uh, we hold space for her. Thank you so much. Um, it means a whole lot to her. She is going to be pawing through these questions uh, later, and it'll mean a lot, all of uh, the good wishes that you have. So thank you very, very much. All right, uh, let's see, uh, Jay Beans, um, maybe the chat can answer, why does she go to the RPF? Uh, okay, is it because um, Mike Blue, I think that's what you were talking about, and I think we've answered that, so thank you so much for the question, I appreciate it. 
All right, Nancy, no 12. Mike, do the security guards eat in the same place as Rosemary was working? Would the security around the Big Blue know her uh, by Rosemary Chickwalk? They 100% would. So they probably do eat in and around the same locations, like in those same mess halls. There's like a couple mess halls where everybody goes to do all of their eating. When the protesters are there and they... Um, and they're in these other buildings, there's a tunnel system where they can kind of move in and around uh, from one building to another and not go outside. That's why you never see anybody. And they've covered up all the windows. I guarantee if all of those window coverings came off, it would look like an ant hive inside. So they are able to go to that. But there are a couple dining rooms. The security guards are either going to eat there or they're going to have uh, basically take their meals to go. Uh, Rosemary has been down in that location, either on the rehabilitation project force or working in those organizations for like all, like a decade and a half. I guarantee everybody down there, unless they are new within the last two years, knows exactly who she is. She has been, she was one of the oldest um, Scientologist Sea Org members and one of the most senior in uh, longevity there. So when they would have their little Sea Org Day ceremony, she would get, you know, they give them like a little extra bonus. Like it's like, hey, here's an extra like 20 bucks. She was been there for so long. She was getting like an extra like 400 or 500 dollars or even more than that just because of her longevity they're like gosh she's we're gonna have to keep giving her 20 bucks a year extra um and they kind of starts adding up so you can get an idea that I, but i guarantee if uh the protesters were like hey rosemary rosemary chickwalk she's still alive she didn't die she's speaking out about the abuse and people if they heard that would be like what is going on so i highly recommend that they go ahead and do it thank you very very much all right, uh, Deanna Ross, question. No question, it's outrageous. It is, I agree, thank you. All right, Simply Sarah. Is there a lawsuit pending for what happened to your mom? So we did um, work with a legal team basically to send a demand letter, um, kind of laying out all of this and saying, hey, it's kind of hard to refute. Like talking about having the receipts, Quite, I literally have all of the financial records down to every penny and I documented it very thoroughly. I'm, I'm fairly um, specific about when I get into documenting and doing um, office work. So it was pretty tightly documented. We sent a demand letter. We were able to get um, her money back. They almost threw it at us. Um, but I was looking for more damages than that, but I can just say there's some legal stuff pending and um, I don't want to talk too much about it, but I think putting the word out um, and changing the narrative to include, hey, senior abuse in Scientology and the C organization is not just a problem that occurred with one person. It's an ongoing issue with people that are still there. Add this to part of the narrative, try to help people. And it's hard if we are sharing these stories for them to ignore people's outcry if they're asking for help and uh, change with stuff. So thank you very much. All right, Andrew Humphrey, question, would it be helpful for the Squirrel Squad if they, yeah, in, um, if they mention Rosemary and uh, to the seniors they see in LA or Clearwater, not so much Clearwater. She was always in the LA area or at the international base, which is in Riverside County, uh, just outside of San Jacinto and Hemet there in Gilman hot Springs. Those are the two locations. Everyone at both one of these at both properties, both uh, Hollywood and at the other property at Gilman hot Springs, they would know her. So um, yeah, I mean, bring it up. You know, it, she is okay with being part of this movement as much as she can be. And this is, I think, our best way in order to, between my busy schedule and her trying to enjoy her life, which she more than deserves at this point, but still being able to share her story and make a difference. I think that this is important. So we'll do, do everything we can. Why not? All right, Nancy, no 12. Uh, could you show us on Google Maps which buildings in LA she was, uh, for us, not familiar with the area? I have an idea from those that have been filming that lately. Um, yes, I can. I'm not really set up to do that tonight, but I'll try to do another video where I actually do a Google Earth fly through of that location and show where some stuff is. She's given some interesting information on some additional doors that they put in in the back of that advanced organization, Los Angeles, where they'll actually route the public from the back side of that building through that continental liaison office. So that's that kind of intermediate building that's uh, next to their little uh, parking lot right there and out the other side, um, kind of on the back street over by a Wendy's. And that's how people are likely getting in and out and the squirrel squads missing them. So um, I will try to uh, put something together on that and factor that in on one of the videos. So um, good call. Thank you very much. All right, dawned on me question. Um, don't want to be offended. Mike, weren't you yourself abused at the ranch? Uh, why didn't you think your mom would be as well? Um, fair question. So I was, I went through a lot as a kid 
And I went through the point um, where I wanted to leave when I was 15 years old. I wasn't allowed to, and I was put on heavy manual labor until I was at about uh, 17 years old. After about 18 months of being isolated and made to work, I was also getting to the point of being 18. I wasn't well educated, and I thought that I was kind of stuck in the situation. Um, so I decided to stay. And then I dedicated um, the next um, eight, 10 years of my life working there. Um, I have an ex-wife that's still there. Um, she does makeup for um, the, all the Scientology uh, videos and movies and David Miscavige and stuff. But um, we were all there. I was I grew up there and I was very much conditioned to be in this organization. When I ended up blowing and leaving at 27 years old, um, I was disconnected from by my now ex-wife. Um, I was divorced. She filed for divorce. Uh, Rosemary sent me disconnection letter and uh, we had our, our life torn apart. That was something she was required to do. She had dedicated herself to this and didn't know any other world other than that. So I don't hold it against her. Um, but at the same time, as I was leaving, she was probably in her 50s and I was trying to just get my life started. I was 27 years old with no credit history and uh, no career, and I decided to join the military. So then for the next 20 years, I spent time in the military trying to make something um, of my life, and I spent a lot of that time deployed. Um, looking back on it, I didn't have access to her. I'd try to write her letters, wouldn't really hear much back, um, try to see her at family reunions. That never really worked. I really thought she wanted to be there, and I think I was naive in thinking that they would treat they would take care of their people uh, up at the international base. The biggest problem around that place was David Miscavige being a total prick. Um, I see that now as naive in hindsight being 2020. Um, I think I was an idiot not to expect that this was what was actually happening. And it is something that I am remorseful for. It's a fair question, but I wish I had a better answer other than um, what happened happened. And I, now have her in a situation where she's very safe. She has a lot of life enrichment opportunities, access to our family. She can make phone calls whenever she wants. We spend time together. She knows her grandchildren. So we're in a better situation now. And I know I can do better moving forward. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Thanks for the question. <clears throat> All right. Blackmail question. Um, how did she um, disconnect from you? Did you forgive her? So the disconnection, um, I didn't take it personally because I know that when you're, when the disconnection happens, it is mandated by the organization. They do a bunch of double talk saying that they don't do that. It is 100% crap. So when getting those letters of disconnection, it's not wondering if you will, it's wondering when you will, because they're going to be requirements. Like you either come back or we're going to declare you a suppressive person and we're going to disconnect from you. Um, I've been doing an interview series with um, um, Miriam Francis and um, with that, uh, it's the Lighthouse Project. And um, this, this project has been absolutely uh, fabulous as we're going through it, um, both, uh, both Miriam and Christy uh, together have helped me kind of piece all that parts of my story and we're kind of editing out all together. They're doing the editing, but as those come out, it's going to share more of the specifics on my story. So kind of look for that coming in the future and there'll be more uh, to look at as we go forward. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there's additional questions. If there are other questions, uh, probably stop at this point because I'm still trying to catch up on the other ones. So I'll, I'll probably try to go for uh, at least another uh, 20 or 30 minutes or roll through these as much as possible. So I, if I don't get to everyone's, I very much apologize. This isn't the last one I'm going to do. We're not going anywhere. We're going to bring you more information and more specifics from mom. So thank you very much. All right, the sassy sister question, uh, how is the state not investigating uh, for elder abuse? Um, that's a good question. So like all things, like I had contacted, uh, once they're out of the state, um, I, I contacted uh, the um, kind of the elder abuse hotline for California. And they're like, so where is she again? And she's in another state now. So like, oh, we can't do anything about that. So now it is really in the hands of, well, it, does law enforcement want to do anything? All of this information and all of the details have been provided to uh, local and federal law enforcement down to every detail. Nothing is being, no stone left unturned. The information is out there. It, we're now at the point where we're going to make the information public so that it's part of the conversation because that's what needs to happen at this point. But it's a fair question and I have the same one. So thank you very much. Pause for Andrea. 
a lot of these buildings sound like they are breaking fire code regulations. Request records uh, reinspections. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. I don't know how hard it would be to demand that a church provides records and how that works or what the inspection criteria are. I've asked mom, I'm like, were there like fire sprinklers and like normal requirements for big buildings? Like what was the state of things? Because it sounded like a lot of these rooms are extremely run down and they didn't even have HVAC. They were kind of stuffed in. It doesn't even sound like it's up to code. And that is something that the actual state could look into. And that could be a vehicle and a mechanism to actually get in there and see what's going on. Why they drove, like she talked about being driven to the hospital. She's having a, she's having a, like an actual problem. They should have called 911. The reason why they don't is they don't want emergency services to see how these people live. That is why they will take somebody if they're dying. And she has some stories that she's talked about where somebody was dying in there and they actually will drive them to the hospital as they're dying, as opposed to actually having EMTs come in and see what the state of stuff is, because those persons are, are mandatory reporters. So there's a lot going on here and we hope to be able to bring some of this forth. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Ann, question. Um, do not, uh, not to get too morbid, Mike, do you and Rosemary know what would happen when somebody passed away there? I'm assuming that they wouldn't notify family to collect, they would not, wouldn't notify family to collect the body. It depends if the person has family. Um, most of the time, um, if someone does die there, they, they have a ceremony that they do because they really believe the people that are there are like firm believers in everything. There is a, there is a death ceremony that they do. And they kind of put the person, like we were talking about that leave of absence thing towards the end. This is the stuff they kind of like say, Hey, they're granted a leave of absence. We'll see in 21 years. And they really believe this stuff. Um, I'm like, likely if there was family or next to kin, they would, uh, I'm guessing notify the family. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt on that, but I do not know exactly. Um, I haven't had to uh, deal with kind of the mortuary affairs aspect of that, but good question. Thank you. All right. Lydia Von Stretchclaw question. Do we know if other elderly members have been moved out of the uh, big blue and nursing home premises and maybe hidden somewhere else? That's a good question. All of our information and what uh, mom has provided is um, accurate based off of um, the way things were in uh, 2021. So in February 2021, that's kind of when her uh, exposure there stopped, at which point we've documented all of the specifics on who was where at what time. And uh, when I do a Google Earth um, kind of fly through, I'll also show you the other buildings where they were housing other elderly. Um, and some of those are off campus and then some of those are on campus. So I'll do the best that I can with that, at least with the information that I had at the time. Good question. Thank you. All right, uh, King's Kid question. Can we donate to a wish list and others who have escaped this evil church? Um, as foundations pop up, being able to donate to those foundations, that's an excellent way to do so. Uh, the Aftermath Foundation's been um, in existence for a while. There should be, Aaron's talked about creating another foundation in the future. So hopefully something happens uh, going forward on that where we have a lot of these organizations. So as I think, um, um, requests for help come out uh, for financial assistance. You know, I'm kind of, you know, as, as mom potentially needs help with something, and I've seen some other comments on here of can people give, you know, uh, we'll be able to make a little bit off of this YouTube thing, but that's, I'm not really doing it to make any money. Factually, this isn't worth the money and the um, for the time that I put into it. I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. But as we make money, the money that comes from this is going to be going to her care fund. Um, we were able to get some money back. There were some legal fees that had to be dispersed as part of that. Um, so it, it kind of goes fast. And then uh, anyone who has dealt with senior living knows that it is not cheap. So um, the fact that Scientology doesn't have a good solution for it and um, is why they're then kind of coming up with a cheap solution for it. So they need to, if they were doing right by people, it would be very, very expensive because there's no 401ks. They're not paying these people enough to have their own retirements. They're trying to get all of their money from them. That's why they have to work them almost until they die because, uh, or else they're, they're putting out a bunch of money that they don't have coming in the door except from their rich donors. So um, again, it's another strategy that David Miscavige has um, backed himself into a corner on, uh, just like his other failed real estate crap that he's doing with these ideal orgs. So there you go, Dave. Take care of your old people. Thanks for the question. 
Uh, Nancy, no 12 again. Uh, are you okay with people sharing this video or linking to this video uh, from a clip? Absolutely. If you do share the video, you can absolutely share it. I would like if they came to my channel and looked at it as opposed to someone downloading and sharing it just because I am trying to create my own content. Um, and then I want this to be a repository for the stories that I have of uh, the children from Scientology and my story from the ranch and all that, but more specifically, so I have a repository and a centralized location for my mother's story. But please, please, please share this video. Let people know about it. I would like all the protesters to know about it. I'm trying to provide this so we can put a little um, a little context with what it is they're looking at, because these outsides of these buildings, they're really nice. There's a reason why you don't see the insides of the buildings. The public areas where they're delivering the services, they're very lavish. Where these people live, they're not wasting money on them. So it's important that we then talk about it. And you can tell from the way that my mom shares this stuff, she's not embellishing anything. She's just telling her story. So um, if anyone has any questions about that, you're free to have them, but um, we're gonna keep sharing. Thank you very much. Um, Lydia Von Stretchow comment, please send her love to Rosemary. She hears you right now. Thank you so very much, very much appreciated. A uh, question, has Rosemary indicated um, that there were more elderly that are currently believes they're being deprogrammed or reconnected with family if given the opportunity? This is a hard question and it kind of goes to what it takes um, to get somebody out of Scientology. If you are constantly being barraged every single day where they're controlling your behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions, the bite model that's talked about by um, Dr. Stephen Hassan. Um, he's got a great book on combating cult mind control. 100% you should go and uh, read it. But if you're controlling all those aspects of people's lives, you can keep them under your control. Mom, when she was moved into a hospice facility, she wasn't under their control. They were expecting her to die. She's entirely too stubborn. And when you actually were uh, in a situation where she was able to sleep, to get on now on oxygen therapy, start eating, she started getting better. They weren't watching what she was doing. And she's like, I really want to talk to my family. So she started reaching out to family. She reached out to me. And slowly over the course of time, we kind of spoon fed her more information at the rate she was able to consume it, not pushing anything on her until she made her own decision. That for her took several months. The normal Scientologist, you can see they're talking to this people on L. Ron Hubbard way. That one lady, that Russian lady was happy to talk to them. She, they were just asking her, Hey, why do you love Scientology and stuff? She was talking to them within one minute. That security guard came out grabbed her by the arm and drug her inside like that. Like, Oh, Oh, that she might get a thought in her head. Let's, let's control this. This is what they're doing. They say they can communicate about anything. They, you know, think for yourself, they're all catchphrases to control people, but look at what's actually going on. In Rosemary's situation, she was able to see the truth and come to her own conclusions. It's very hard unless you can like get information to them. So at least you're putting little cracks in the dam as you're as they see protesters out there, as they're saying things. I would say try to be compassionate to the people inside. Tell them there's people out here that want to help them. Um, and if nothing else, it'll just sit, sit in their mind until enough of those things compound along with the abuse that they're enduring where they'll decide to leave. She left when she was in her late seventies. Everyone can do it. If she can do it, you can hear my dog barking in the background. Max is max, but thank you very much. All right, let's see. Uh, pigs is pigs 51. Interesting. Uh, any idea how many seniors in Scientology there are and if they are treated the same way again, the public, uh, that are paying for services, um, they are not the same as these Sea Org members. So in the area where mom was, there was at least uh, about 30 other people that she knew that were in a very similar situation, but there are a lot more that were, you know, aging out and getting older. They might have had other people in other nursing homes, but that's just from her little organization where she was from. So if you think about it, the people that she was around, she knew like she was on one floor of one building, you know, very compartmentalized. It's not like she knew everybody in that whole area. So there's other people in other buildings and other locations in other states at Golden Era Productions. A lot of those people have got to be getting old. I kind of pulled up during her talk, Save Bob Ferris. I knew Bob Ferris. He's up at Golden Era Productions. Bob's in his 70s too. Similar situation. But yes, this is a problem. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lavender Bridges with a touch of guiles. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat. One of my first ones. I appreciate it. <laughs> what are you doing for self-care, Mike? Uh, this is so heavy. Um, that's a good question. So I'm in the military and I have compartmentalized most of this for my uh, adult life since I've left. And it's easy for me to put stuff behind me. But then uh, when you start looking at it, it's a little bit hard. 
So um, I am getting help as I need to. Uh, I'm being here for my mom. There's a lot to work through, but um, at the same time, I'm looking into options for self-care. But factually talking about this, and I like, and as you probably see it, I like to talk. I like the sound of my own voice, and it, it doesn't bother me. I'm an instructor pilot. Uh, I lecture as part of what I do for my job, so I like to talk. So this, for me, actually feels quite good. So some of the videos that I've done, I've gone on with some of my old friends and people that had beef with me, and now we've become friends to work through things. Um, I get a lot out of this, too, but um, it's a great question. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the super chat. All right. Um, let's see. Carolyn T. Do we know how many more elderly are stuck in this hellhole? Um, kind of talked about that a little bit, um, but I assume quite a few. Unless they've been gotten out of there, there's probably family that um, want, wants to help them. Hopefully, hopefully us complaining about this, like you see that they're not um, having as many young children come into the C organization anymore. It's because of things like Jenna speaking out, writing her book, people that are complaining, they're like, uh oh, this is becoming a legal problem. And then they change it. So the more pressure we put on this, them losing their tax exempt status would be great because then they wouldn't have the protections and people could sue them a whole lot easier. That would be wonderful. But bringing pressure, they're going to be forced to do this. So they're going to try to change the narrative like, oh, we take care of our old people. We never had that happen. Hopefully this is the effect that we're going to kind of get to as part of this. So that's that's my hope. So we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, let me see. Painting puzzles, uh, painting and puzzles, princess. Mike, um, were you there when they authorized her to drop their body? I wouldn't uh, be surprised, but I can't imagine. So I was there, was in the the hospital room. So everything that they do is like a task when you're in this organization. You're given a mission, you go and do it, you execute it, you go to the next thing just because your day is just jam-packed full. Like that was her job of coming to the hospital that day was to authorize her to drop her body. So I was there for it. Um, I was sort of like, I wasn't sure what to say. Like, what do I do with my hands? It was, I'd never seen that before. And I was like, this is so impersonal. Um, but for them, it's like part of what they actually believe. And then I think it was solving a problem of the fact that she's a problem for them because she's old. So, um, yeah, good question. And I didn't like hearing it, but I'm kind of glad that I did because if nothing else, I can share it. So thank you. All right. Uh, Gary Mackey put up a wish list. We will help. Thank you. I do need to, um, figure that out. I, I will try to do so. I very, very much appreciate it. Um, so what I will try to do is, you know, like I said, elder uh, elder care is uh, expensive. We'll figure out a way to do this. The Aftermath Foundation was very, very helpful. We do have some money that we're able to kind of uh, work towards this now. But my goal in doing some of this stuff is to generate some additional sources of income so I'm able to help that process along and um, so that I'm not going cap in hand trying to figure out better ways to do that. Me being in the military um, and me speaking out, this is me doing it as a private citizen. I'm not representing the military or anything like that. I always kind of throw in that disclaimer. No one really cares. But um, I'm trying to share my story and I'm trying to get this word out. But me, I mean, the job that I have, I'm like, you know, I don't have a like a, a side hustle and it's not like I can make a, a a lot of additional income because I can't really have time to uh, do another job. I like what I do. I make good money, but at the same time I have the other family. So it's just some different things to juggle, but we're going to figure it out and it's all going to be good. And I guarantee what I will make a priority is taking care of my mother. So, ah, Sterling, one of my closest and oldest friends, although I'm slightly older than him, but I think I get what you mean. Uh, thanks so much for sharing. Mike elder abuse has to stop. Great job. Hey man, I appreciate it. Thanks. I I like the support. Uh, again, I feel like I'm out here doing this uh, without a net. So I appreciate it very much. Uh, up Mayo, so glad um, you're monetized, uh, but do add another donation source uh, to your description. That's a great idea. Um, I will figure out a way to do that, figure out a way that if people do want to donate, I know putting it through YouTube, it's good for YouTube. It's even you know good for me, but I think they do take a portion of it. So if people do want to help, I should figure out a way to do that. So let me figure it out and I'll let everybody know. Um, and then on future videos, um, I'll make sure I uh, share it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Um, Lori, super sticker. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. And uh, Pocono Pluck, um, a protester uh, asked uh, James, the security guard, James, the big blue, if he knew Rosemary Chick walk this week. Awesome. Love it. <laughs> hey, Rosemary's great. I guarantee anyone that knows her likes her. And if it's like, wait, Rosemary, like I remember Rosemary. I, I bet 
I, I bet they didn't say Rosemary's an SP. I bet they said Rosemary passed away. Um, I, she still gets, um, like these digital, um, birthday cards or, you know, different holiday cards from one of her friends. And I think that they think that she's either in a nursing home or she might've passed. So kind of interesting. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham, uh, grandma, Matilda matters, Rosemary, you are an incredible woman. Yes, she is. We love her very, very much. Uh, Arta A, you're a wonderful son, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, trying to do better now. Um, obviously, we're moving forward from this point and we're going to make a huge difference. So thank you so, so much. All right. And then, and uh, for Rosemary and you, uh, there is a third party address uh, for the other than the aftermath to send Rosemary a card while keeping her, her in your privacy. Um, I'll work that out. I am going to set up a PO box or something like that. But that, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and we will work that out. All right. I see that since I have started asking questions, there have been a tremendous amount of other questions that are probably popped up in the live. I'm just going to kind of scroll through these real fast to see if there's anything that I haven't really talked about. Again, there's probably um, a tremendous amount uh, to uh, still talk about. Um, and we, we will do additional videos. So as we're going through this, um, you know, I know that there's probably a lot of questions that are still there. I think at this point, I'm probably going to move more towards wrapping it up. But I very, very much appreciate everyone uh, tuning in with us. Um, we're going to bring you more content and more specifics. I think specifics are important as we go through this so that we're able to um, provide that information so that people are able to act on it. Um, it's easy to see, you know, uh, the LAPD assisting Scientology and their nice buildings outside and them to sit there like, oh, we're being wrongfully targeted. Look, these are peaceful protests and they're going and asking questions that why isn't Scientology coming and like talking to them? Where is their press person coming out and saying, hey, I'll talk to you. What are your questions? And just sitting down like I am. I would be happy if anyone in Scientology thinks that this is crap and I'm not bringing the truth come on my channel and talk to me about it. Even if you don't want to come on my channel, I put up my email address in here, email me. We'll talk about it. I am 100% open to any sort of discussions or criticisms about it, but it's going to be kind of hard because ah, you guys, as soon as we're like, hey, you started doing something wrong, they threw it, they, they tried to return all of her money without even like saying, do you really think this is the right amount? It was like abrupt. And I was like, whoa. So um, I think there's a lot of meat on that bone and we will look at it. Um, sort of as a, uh, add a little levity to the situation. I think any, uh, good video, um, it would probably not be complete if we took, if we didn't take the opportunity to mess a little mess with Tom Cruise just a little bit. So I do have an outro here that I made, um, to kind of show some of the absurdity. Everyone's seen the, uh, the Tom Cruise video where he's sitting there pontificating with his turtleneck, um, on how, um, much they're just pretending most of the time. So anyway, for everyone that tuned in, thank you so, so much for doing so. Um, I hope to be able to put up some video content, hopefully weekly. I'm trying to work through these edits. And again, I have uh, this kind of as a side gig with a lot of other responsibilities, but this is important to get out there. So we'll continue to work on it. Thank you to everyone. Um, please, if you haven't, uh, hit the like button. It'll help at least push out the notifications. Um, if you like my content, I would appreciate it if you subscribe so I can just keep getting the message out. Thank you very much. And I will leave you with Tom. Being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. As you drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one that can really help. We were in the middle of our tournament where my friend John said he found a body in the bushes over there. I ran over there because I'm a healing monk to try and help, but obviously my magic wasn't strong enough because the dude's body was missing a head. He or she has the ability to create new and better realities and improve conditions. So my friend decided to try and use a necromancer spell, which didn't work, which I knew it wouldn't. Uh... Being Scientologist, you look at someone and you know absolutely that you can help them. And apparently we contaminated the crime scene because that spell uses a lot of glitter. I think it's a privilege to call yourself a Scientologist and it's something that you have to earn. And because a Scientologist does 